for every American foot soldier killed in World War II, three were wounded. For every American airman wounded, three were killed. Flyers nonetheless admired foot soldiers for the agony they had to endure. Flyer, on the other hand, had rather to fall than the combat casualty in the hedgerows of Normandy. A flyer like B-17 co-pilot Claire Abbott Tyler had five miles to fall. This was the position of Tyler's B-17 on March 6, 1943, in the van of the 360th Squadron, 303rd Bomb Group, headed for its target that day, the French port at Lorient. Tyler's day began with his 3 a.m. wake-up, followed by a breakfast of faintly green powdered eggs, slabs of inert spam, wilted toast, and mugs of black coffee. After breakfast and a mission briefing, it would have been Tyler's job to check every inch of his B-17 to make sure that there was sufficiency of everything from machine gun ammunition to the P-tubes that seldom work since you're in pros at altitude. Most of all, it was Tyler's job to make sure that his pilot, Martin Flocker, had fuel tanks that were top. Tyler was a veteran after a month with the 360th. He'd flown three times before with Lieutenant Flocker. This was the crew list on March 6, 1943, and these men were pioneers because this was early in the American Air War. They were to prove the effectiveness of daylight precision bombing, the British bombed at night, and of the vaunted Norden bomb site. Theory was that dense formations of heavy bombers could both destroy strategic targets and the will of the German people. This theory was mistaken. The Germans learned to rebuild and disperse bomb factories and the bombing of civilian targets only seemed to galvanize German civilians. They called the Americans terror flyers, and by war's end, they sometimes lynched flyers who had parachuted to Earth. A year after Tyler's 1943 mission, the B-17's bomb drops were almost their secondary purpose. They served as much value as bait. They lured up German fighter pilots, the cream of the Luftwaffe, so that they could be winnowed down by Americans flying planes like the P-51 Mustang. B-17s were called flying fortresses because each plane carried a battery of 50 caliber machine guns from nose to tail and in the ball turret suspended underneath like a plexiglass teardrop. They flew in dense box formations, wingtip to wingtip, to maximize their defensive power. Most vulnerable B-17s were those that had to leave the protective formation because of combat damage or mechanical problems. If they were lucky, in 1943, they would have been met at the continent's edge by fighter escorts who would shepherd them home. But even leaving home from a base like RAF Molesworth in East Anglia was dangerous. Tyler's pilot, Martin Flocker, would typically have to fly blind in the fog or cloud cover typical of England to reach his squadron's assembly point high above RAF Molesworth. Every member of Flocker's 10-man crew would have kept his eyes in constant motion looking for other B-17s. But collisions like this one between two B-17s above their base were frequent. The squadron's target that day was Lorient, a port underneath the arm of Brittany where U-boats nose needle-like 
into the Atlantic. The U-boat's attacks on North Atlantic convoys had nearly starved England to death. They also represented a threat to the growing numbers of American soldiers arriving in England. But the Lorient subpens built by forced labor were so heavily reinforced that they remain there today. The 360th mission that day was to disrupt Lorient by hitting bridges and a power station, which might indirectly impact the U-boat campaign against the convoys bringing American manufacturers to the war in Europe. The B-17 itself was one of the products of the industrial miracle that did so much to win World War II. It was a remarkably resilient aircraft, respected by its air crews. These photos show B-17s that came back to base after suffering damage that should have been fatal. Nevertheless, the B-17 that Claire Tyler co-piloted in 1943 had a fatal weakness. There was not enough armament forward. This deficiency was corrected later in the war by a two-gun chin turret beneath the plexiglass nose. That day, German fighters appeared after the bomb run, when Lieutenant Blocker had begun his ship's homeward turn. They were Vakbuth 190s when they came out of the sun. And they had been trained to attack the B-17s head-on, where they were most vulnerable. A 20-millimeter cannon shell killed Claire Abbott Tyler in his seat. He died so suddenly that he didn't have the time to reflect on the places he would never see again. He grew up in Morro Bay, and every morning of his waking he would have seen Morro Rock, the Gibraltar of the Pacific, sometimes crowned by fog, as he prepared for school. He would never see the rock again. He would never see his mother again. She sometimes drove Claire up to the bay for visits to family. Her enchiladas were legendary. He would never again see his father, who took him bird hunting and instructed him in the safe care and handling of a 410 shotgun. He would never again see his wife, Joanna. They'd been married here at Mission San Luis Obispo. Alex Madonna had been Claire's best man. Most of Tyler's crew survived the German fighters' attack. They had to ditch the damaged B-17 at sea, but had been picked up to become POWs. They would be liberated and come home in 1945. But Claire Abbott Tyler wouldn't come home. He would never again see his little girl, who would have been taking her first steps at the time of the mission to Lorient. She would make the journey of her life without her father. 